Okay, it's half past six, so I'm going to make a start now. I'm Rachel. Um, you can see my selfie there. Um, I'd like to thank um, the LRAC for inviting me to, to give this talk tonight. Um, I'm just going to ask again if people could switch their mics off because I'm getting quite a lot of feedback, so it makes it quite hard to hear oneself think with a lot of background noise. So if, if you could switch your mic off, that would be great. If any questions at all, just tap in the box as we go through um, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them at the time. And if I don't, then remind me at the end when we'll have time for questions then as well. Um, as Linda said, my interest is uh, the First World War. I'm a, a social and cultural historian rather than a military one. So although I am a fully paid up member of the Western Front Association, I'm not kind of, oh, fate, don't start asking me about cat badges or anything like that because I, I don't have all the military data. Um, I am interested, as you'll see from the product positioning of my book there, um, in uh, food and soldiers of the Great War. So people say to me, not quite so much nowadays, but certainly 15 years or so ago, people would say, why are you doing food, Rachel? You know, who cares about food? That's a kind of very mundane sort of thing to be interested in. But of course, um, you know, material culture has, has assumed a bigger role in, in history over the last 15 years, probably. So um, people don't ask with quite so much sort of wonderment and, and, and puzzlement uh, now as they did then. I should say that like many research projects, and I know some of you because I recognize some of the names, I know some of you will be thinking and, and, and uh, working out your own kind of um, master's research projects um, at the moment or over the next few months. Like many research projects, this started off as something different. I was interested in how the rank and file soldiers of the British Army express the um, emotions um, and, and the kind of thoughts and feelings that um, war generated for them. Because like most uh, people growing up in, in the English school system, I don't know how it is in other parts of the UK, but certainly in the English school system, when I was 14, we did the, the war poets in our English literature um, uh, 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 lesson. I didn't learn anything really about the First World War in history lessons when I was at school, but quite a lot about the First World War in literature lessons. So very familiar with um, people like, let me just move on, Wilfred Owen here. And... Uh, Expect you mostly know the story that his his mother received the telegram um, telling her of his death just as the church bells were chiming for the armistice uh, on the 11th of the 11th 1918. So, you know everything about Paul Wilfred's life really and his death has kind of come to personify the, the the brutality and the waste of the First World War. And it's not just his poetry that's so mesmerizing, as you can see from this fragment of one of the letters he wrote to his mother. You know, this is a, a man who's, who's grasp of the English language and his ability to, uh, uh, you know, turn emotion into words is, is second to none. So people like Owen, like Sassoon, Graves, Blunden, you know, they're all the officer class, and these were the people that I read and, and learned about. I mean, someone like Isaac Rosenberg is probably one of the few rank and file poets, but, you know, he doesn't get as much, much oxygen um, as the officers do. So all I wanted to know was, when I looked, was doing some postgraduate study, was what did uh, the, you know, what are the, the masses of the British Army, what did they write about emotion? Now, because I'm not expecting them all to write like Wilfred Owen, because most of the officers didn't like write like Wilfred Owen. But I was expecting a little more than the kind of letter, as we see here, from George Stouffer, who was in the Suffolk Regiment. This is another letter to a mother, but a very different one. Now, I haven't been inaccurate in my, um, you know, setting up of my slides. Uh, George never uses any punctuation other than the odd capital letter. So there are no full stops, no commas, no nothing in any of his letters. But they are, inc uh, you know, a very impressive archive um, and in fact compared to many rank and file soldiers George does occasionally talk about how he feels because what I discovered was that rank and file soldiers very rarely uh, talked about how they felt either in their letters home or indeed in their memoirs you know a few exceptions but but it wasn't really about emotions but what it was about very often it was about food 
there's an awful lot about food um, in the letters of the First World War. Um, and it's about, they're describing, and, and memoirs and, and indeed diaries. So soldiers are describing memorable meals in cafes, they're describing buns in canteens, contents of parcels from home. Um, they're not often saying very good things about the ration, but they are making a lot of complaints about them. Sometimes their letters home actually read rather like shopping lists. Um, there's a wonderful one from a private Brown to his wife, which says, don't send me any more Oxo or Bovril until I ask you to, darling, will you? The little pat of butter is always welcome. Good substitutes for things I have asked you not to send would be sardines, pickles, or a bit of cheese. And these go on and on and on uh, listing uh, food. So it was clear that something was going on um, in uh, uh, the area of eating for these men. And it begs the question, you know, what was missing from the army rations that left the men so uh, uh, vocal um, in their complaints and also so um, insistent on their demands that they sent home for different types of food stuff. Now, deficiencies in the ration were something of a sore point for many soldiers. Um, and this is a quotation from a diary that's in the Imperial War Museum. Um, and uh, each is saying that, you know, forget what the Germans did in Belgium and elsewhere, but, you know, the British army is almost as bad and cruel that they've not had a second vegetable and often none at all. Now, Eaches was not an ironic man. This isn't a diary packed with wit and humour and sarcasm. You know, he's deadly serious um, because it's it seems in many places that, you know, food becomes something of a metaphor for far larger, wider concerns. Um, you know, men who'd given up their freedom or been forced to give up their freedom um, from 1916 onwards and through conscription uh, to, to serve in the British Army felt that the very least they were due was, uh, uh, you know, a decent meal two or three times a day. Um, and that the kind of lack of care that could be evidenced in poor quality food was kind of Indic indicative of much, um, you know, other other concerns that men had about the way that the army treated them, and of course, you know, food is a is a terribly emotional subject. You know, it, it comes freighted with um, far more than just its calorific values. You know, you don't have to be an anthropologist, a psychologist, sociologist, or a dietitian, you know, or a reader of popular magazines or whatever to know that eating is very, you know. I'm not saying rarely, but it's about a lot more than pure nutritional need. You know, people eat for many different reasons that have often have very little to do with hunger, whether it's loneliness, boredom, fear, homesickness, whatever. And I suppose starting with a kind of, you know, I'm not a Kleinian analyst, so we won't be looking at, um, you know, the child at its mother's breast. But it is from that moment, you know, baby's birth, that food is not just about the meeting of physiological needs, but it's also about psychological comfort. So. You know, I would argue, and I wouldn't be alone in that, that you cannot underestimate the importance of food. You know, it is, we are what we eat. It is central to people's sense of identity. Um, and the other thing, interesting enough, in the psychology of food is something perhaps that we know instinctively, that when humans are under a great deal of pressure and feel threatened, uh, the thing they really don't want to be presented with are unfamiliar food stuff. So, you know, the army does have a problem in that it's got men who are, you know, mainly citizen soldiers. They weren't, um, you know, soldier, they, were, they were war conscripts. You know, lots of them do not want to be there. They're not very happy. They're also very frightened when they get anywhere near the front line. And of course, trying to feed people in, in, under those conditions um, are going to be challenging. So for these millions of civilian soldiers who found themselves caught up in this very alien military world, you know, it wasn't only the exchange of a name for a number um, or the uniform or the drill square that came as a shock. It was also the food and not just the food, the way it was consumed, you know, that dirty cutlery in, in filthy, noisy mess halls, you know, having to run and grab food, you know, this was something that was an affront to Men of all classes, you know, working class set great store by proper meal times, you know, the, the um, uh, respectable working classes. So this kind of, you know, free for all in the mess halls, which was not uncommon uh, in army experience, was something that many men commented upon. And the other thing is, you know, I'm, I'm a British histor historian of the British army and, you know, I certainly don't want to get to court get caught up in any uh, racial stereotypes. Uh, but maybe the British diet was more restricted than other nations at this point. Um, certainly the Brit British have always had a reputation 
uh, for being very conservative in their eating. Uh, Voltaire said that the English had 42 religions, but only two sources. So perhaps there was something about the British men that made them less adaptable um, to, to different types of eating and different types of foodstuffs than soldiers of other armies. Um, I haven't done a kind of comparative study on that, but you know the narrowness of that British diet probably didn't help people transferring to uh, different spaces of eating um, and different types of food. But of course, you know, the, while the English, uh, the British soldiers complained about their own rations, it was as nothing as to how appalled they were by the kind of food that the French and Germans um, uh, ate. And this is a postcard from Donald McGill, who's um, probably better known for his saucy seaside postcards, but uh, he did one of um, German food. Um, and this pretty much sums up the uh, response of British soldiers to, to food that they came across in, in sometimes when you know advances were made and they entered a German trench and they were appalled by um, black bread. You know, people in England wanted to eat white bread. They didn't want to eat any old black stuff. They were appalled by blood sausage, which rather ignores the fact that blood pudding, um, uh, black pudding was uh, quite a popular dish, obviously, in, in England too. I doubt Donald McKill had, had ever seen sauerkraut um, because obviously it's white. Uh, it's not green cabbage that he's got here. But smelly cheese and, you know, that kind of thing, these are not the sort of um, foodstuffs that British soldiers were keen to get their hands on. But the card is really an, an indication, I think, of the kind of um, associations that food carries and the concerns it can carry as well. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah. British soldiers, as we'll see, were, were somewhat um, unwilling to engage, certainly even with French cuisine in their spare time. But aside from the emotional context of food, it is, of course, a kind of logistical, medical, um, um, morale and physical story as well. You know, the army has got vast, I mean, this is the, the logistical challenge of feeding um, such vast numbers of men was nothing, you know, like nothing that the army um, had ever faced before. And in March 1918, there were over 1.8 1. million um serving soldiers on the Western Front. So huge quantities of men. And and I'm, my, I'm interested, obviously, in the Army's logistics, but um, how um, the rations that they offered, uh, uh, you know, the kind of um, the cooks that they used, the recipes that they used, uh, the impact on health. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, teeth were a particular problem, not helped. Um, you know, general health problem in Britain at this point, but certainly not helped uh, by army service, the products that were provided for them there. And also, you know, gastroenteritis you know, this has made life in the trenches miserable, stomach upsets and, and all sorts of um, horrible digestive disturbances. So those are the kinds of things um, that I'm interested in. And these are the kinds of things that my research led me to looking in more detail at because no one had really looked at food in the British Army at all. There's some interest in food on the home front. Someone like Jay Winter and um, Ian Beckett also have looked a lot at uh, 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 what people ate at home because, of course, you know, it's the first time in, in British history that food rationing was officially introduced. We kind of think of it as a World War II um, uh, innovation, but uh, rationing appears on the home front in uh, the beginning of 1918 so there's some interest there but the attitude towards the army and soldiers had always been as um, John Burnett said in Plenty and Want that the pre-war uh, pre -war working class diet was very poor uh, therefore soldiers got more calories in the army and therefore logically they must be have been happier with their rations or happy with their rations because it was more calories than they would have got at home. And that view has been echoed by countless historians, you know, from Corelli Barnett to David Silby and most recently um, Adrian Gregory in his very good book, The Last Great War, although I take issue obviously with him on the matter of soldiers food but it was interesting that historians are saying this, the historiography is adamant that, you know, um, this is absolutely no problem for the men, but it was clear from the archives that that, that wasn't a view shared by the soldiers. There was a distinct lack of enthusiasm.
and it, as I say, it's this gap that, that's so interesting to me. I um, mean, it's indisputable that the pre-war working class diet in Britain was very poor. You know, um, social investigators like Mrs. Pember Reeves had looked at diet just before the First World War. And, you know, people existing on, um, you know, bread and tea, a, a very kind of sorry state for much of the British working classes. Um, and pre-war army food had been, well, considerably worse than it ends up being in the First World War. The first ration scales were introduced in 1813 after lots of problems in the Peninsula War where um, you know men went very hungry indeed because armies traditionally were fed on the hoof that you know as they over as they moved across land they they accumulated supplies and and they stole cattle and and killed it and ate it so it's a kind of a fluid um, a, a, a way of feeding not very well planned and this did not work um, certainly in the peninsula wars so in 1813 the British army said that every man should be entitled to a pound of bread and 12 ounces of meat a day um, everything else they had to pay for it was deducted from their salary so you know so recruits used to look at the wages going in and think, "Oh, that's not bad." But once they realised, once they had got in and realised the level of deductions, they were generally less enthused by um, army pay. And army food has always been a concern. You know, it was suggested that soldiers actually ate worse than um, you know they, they would have done if had they been in a prison or indeed in some workhouses. Um, Traditionally, of course, women had uh, done quite a lot of the provisioning for soldiers. This is a, a, an 1855 um, photograph by Roger Fenton from the National Army Museum collection uh, of the Crimea. And uh, we see there uh, a, a, a camp follower or a woman. I mean, these were, you know, not just that we had, I don't know what word to use, I was going to say floozy, I don't know if that's appropriate, but you know, these were often married women who, who went out with their husbands, um, some of them would be on the strength, i.e. on the official numbers of the army, a lot of them weren't, but um, uh, there were opportunities for, for husbands as well out there, There's, I think Mrs. Maybe got married three times because she was unfortunate, in, you know, she was widowed twice but she always found a suitable replacement. So, you know, women had done a lot of the cooking for individual soldiers um, and their friends, um, uh, uh, you know, in the barracks um, of the uh, British Army, certainly before the First World War. The thing about the Crimea as well was it, it made it clear that poor provisioning was going to be a real health issue. Um, in Scutari Hospital on the 2nd of January 1855, 1,200 sick soldiers arrived, British soldiers, and of those, 85% of them were suffering from acute scurvy. Now, the British Army and the Navy, of course, knew how to avoid scurvy. They knew that vitamin C, they might not fully understand the physiological details, but they knew that um, lime juice, lemon juice, uh, would alleviate it. But of course then there was an issue of distribution in that Lord Raglan had sent lots of lime juice to the Crimea, but it sat in a warehouse rather than being distributed to the, tro the troops. So it became clear to the British Army that, you know, it, diet was about more than just um, provide, you know, making sure that um, uh, soldiers um, had uh, proper food. It was also about having the process, you know, that would only happen if processes were in place um, to deliver it. And it's reckoned that uh, Drummond actually calculated on some records he had that instead of getting the four and a half odd thousand calories a day that was needed by an active soldier, in the Crimea soldiers were getting more like two and a half thousand um, a day. So actually Alexis Sawyer, who was the first kind of celebrity cook, went to the Crimea at his own expense in 1855 and reworked the diet at Scutari, Scutari with Florence Nightingale. Um, and he invented a fill stove which was used by the army for the next century or so. In fact they were taken to um, the Falklands as uh, water boilers and about ten years ago at a military event I met a very elderly gentleman who was a tank commander who landed on the beaches on D-Day plus one which was very exciting and he told me that he'd gone across to Germany with a Sawyer stove strapped to the side of his tank which I, I was kind of like gobsmacked I said my god you know that is amazing what did you cook and he said oh no we didn't use it for cooking we used it as a toilet so that was a bit disappointing but I'm sure Sawyer would have been pleased to know that um, his, his design had uh, also a multitude of uses.
And um, people like Kipling, of course, are, are upset and concerned about uh, army food as well. Um, in his 1892 poem, he talks about the cookroom slops. I mean, that's a poem about the veterans of the Crimea and how they weren't looked after. But it's really the Boer War recruiting crisis um, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century that sets the government thinking about the nation's health. Um, and a third of the young men that volunteered to go to the um, go to South Africa with the army had to be rejected because they were they were not fit enough. So it became apparent that you know this was a kind of a, a problem uh, for the whole nation. So the Committee of Phys Physical Deterioration um, is set up to look into it um, and to think about the kind of undernourishment that seems to be apparent uh, amongst the working classes um, of the country. And of course, the key problem resulting from the diet that lacked um, protein, fat, and calcium was bad teeth, which is kind of a recurrent story, really, for the First World War British Army. Um, and in fact, Punch has a lovely cartoon of it from 1914, of a, a disappointed man being sent away by the recruiting sergeant, having seen the doctor, uh, because he hasn't got, his teeth were not good enough. Because at this point in the British Army, you needed to have a certain number of um, uh, molars and sizes and what have you to be allowed into the army. Um, by February 1915 they actually relaxed that because they were losing um, so many people and you could be admitted to the army from February 1915 onward um, with the category past fit subject to dental treatment. So you know teeth and uh, the diet uh, of the British Army as we'll see are something of a problem. I mean this cartoon kind of reminds us I suppose that you know the, the um, declaration of war in uh, August 1914 was met with a great deal of patriotic enthusiasm and Peter Simpkins says it's you know almost half a million men volunteered in the first six weeks following the declaration of war uh, and that caused a lot of problems for the army because the army was not set up to feed uh, so many men and whilst it could improvise with uniforms as it as it did many men ended up wearing a post office, a uh, 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 postman's uniform, because the GPO handed theirs over, which didn't make volunteers very happy. But uniform could be improvised. You know, drill could be practiced with wooden rifles, and frequently was. Men were told to wear their own boots. But improvising with food was not quite so straightforward. So it caused a lot of bad feeling uh, in the early days. And there are protests, there are people leaving um, the army, having signed up, but going home again because they're not being fed properly. But once things had settled down, uh, Kitchener is very organized, starts building these huge tented and then wooden encampments to house the new armies. Once that's all been got under control in the, after the first couple of months, things um, are pretty well organized um, and uh, you know men can rely certainly in the training situation of being fed reasonably well um, and this is a picture I don't know how many first of all postcards you've got at home but I've got quite a lot and my favorite ones obviously are the ones that relate to food um, this is one Photographers went into local army camps and, and took snaps and then converted them to postcards and then sold them to the men. So it was a way of making money. And of course, the men bought them and sent them home. And actually, on the back of this, it says, you know me, mum, I can't ever smile for a photo, Tom. And I don't know which one Tom is because none of them are really smiling, are they? But what's interesting about it in terms of food is that when Kitchener first designed the new camps, he said, we're going to have uh, a proper mess hut on each, you know, for all men will eat in a proper mess hall. We're not going to have any of this eating in the barrack rooms, which was traditionally um, what soldiers had done. But of course, it was very expensive to build great huts um, for eating that weren't going to be used the rest of the time. So pretty much one of the first things to go were the mess halls. So people ended up eating, as you can see, in the space in which they're sleeping. You can see their beds uh, and their packs on the right hand there very clearly. For lots of men, it probably wasn't a problem. It might well have been an advantage because, as I said, it would be more intimate, uh, more convivial. You're eating with people you know, as opposed to having to fight your way um, through the mess hall to get food. So whatever the setting, 
the ration was fixed from very early on in the war and it changed throughout uh, because initially it's all very generous and everybody's getting the same amount which is around 4,200 calories a day as you see there. Now the modern British army um, has pretty much the same it's uh, 4,100 so very different balance of foodstuffs in the modern British Army because nutritional science has come on a long way um, and the large quantity of protein that you see there you know a pound of meat a day you know the body takes a lot of energy to digest protein so it isn't the most efficient way of feeding people and the British Army and it's hard work and uh, you know it's hard on your stomach um, so the British Army today would not be giving its its soldiers anything like um, uh, uh, that that kind of level of meat um, there were a few vegetarians in the army and no provision was made for them Alan um, there were off, I have read account of an officer who managed to survive, but he was a medical officer, so he probably had access to foodstuffs that normal soldiers wouldn't. No, no provision was made in the in the rank and file for vegetarians, um, and the same for um, uh, kosher food. There were some regiments raised in Palestine, and they were the only parts of the British Army that were promised kosher food because that was the deal, the recruitment deal. In the normal British Army, kosher food wasn't served, but the, the chief rabbi gave a dispensation um, that soldiers, Jewish soldiers were allowed not to eat kosher. So, And the same for Muslim soldiers. There were lots of different rations for labor corps. Um, and and some of those obviously acknowledge vegetarianism and and the Indian Army too is different and acknowledge vegetarianism but certainly no the British Army wasn't very bothered um, about a vegetarian diet because what men wanted was the roast beef of old England or some kind of equivalent thereof and when I say equivalent thereof um, it often was an equivalent it was uh, much more likely to be tinned um, bully beef which is a bit like corned beef people don't seem to eat so much corned beef nowadays my mum used to make a hash with mashed potato and corned beef and it was very nice but I probably haven't had that for about 40 years but uh, corned beef or bully beef was a substitute uh, bread which again it was a kind of absolute you know the staff of life this is what the British working classes mainly existed on was large quantities of bread but when that wasn't available hard tack biscuit was provided instead bacon you can see there very popular with um, British uh, soldiers and throughout the working classes because bacon is a, is a, a, a food that um, cooks quickly you know it's all very well buying cheap cuts of meat but then you've got to cook them for hours and that costs a lot of money so for the British working classes uh, the chosen meat was often bacon a little goes a long way it's very flavorsome isn't it you know um, so you could get give your your family a taste of meat um, you could cook it quickly um, and yeah bacon was very popular Fresh vegetables, well, people, you know, the jury was still out on fresh vegetables at this point. Um, you know, people at water who discovered um, proteins uh, and calories said, you know, they're very watery things and probably not that good for the body. The whole of the physiological and nutritional science at this point in time is really focused on calories. You know, it's not about a mixed diet. It's just about how many calories can you get in um, to a person. Uh, just very briefly, I'll show you you can get the slides afterwards but just uh, out of comparison to see that you know the British diet guess who we oh no, that's uh, terribly racist isn't it but the American army ate the best uh, they had the best food but they weren't there very long were they so perhaps they didn't have so many um, supply difficulties as the British army had done um, these are as I mentioned earlier these are front line ration scales so the best food was saved to the soldiers on the front line if you if you were in a training camp at home you'd probably be get in Britain you'd be getting about 3,000 calories a day so far less food available the closer you got to the front line uh, the more calories you got uh, the French up there there's food wasn't you know not terribly plentiful but they got um, a bottle of red wine a day each as well included something of which the British soldiers were very very jealous um, lots of detail uh, it goes down actually to things like salt and pepper powdered mustard um, so you know everything was measured out and the calories all were supposed to be accounted for and when you look at them you know it's very impressive but of course the issue was that that wasn't necessarily what people got you know the idea that 
you know, this is what you should have, um, and, and, you know, what you're actually going to get to eat is something very different. And nobody in the British Army was terribly interested post-war about retaining records of feeding. So there are very few official records remaining. All we have are those sort of huge macro numbers um, in the statistics of the war effort of the British Empire. So you get, you know, tons of this food was provided, you know, tons of that food was provided. But again, there's not much sense of what was actually delivered um, and, uh, uh, you know, um, and, and also, you know, the form of it, you get a sense of that actually in the official statistics because the British Army, it turns out, made quite a lot of money from rabbit skins. Well, you know, rabbit kind of food of the working classes, so men would probably be quite happy to eat it. But, you know, the actual official scale, um, when it says meat, it's really, you know, in the small print, it says beef, but that isn't clearly what um, people were getting. The other thing as well, you know, there were some weird and odd substitutions. Um, the main um, customer for the Norwegian herring um, crop or whatever you call a lot of fish to be sold was Germany traditionally. So the British government and British Army thought it would be a great wheeze to step in and buy all of Norway's um, herrings so the Germans couldn't have them. But that meant that soldiers were being presented with herrings uh, for breakfast, also for lunch and sometimes for tea as well. So there's a lot of very bad tempered stories about too much um, uh, herring, uh, which the British Army obviously had, you know, huge quantity of and it wanted to palm off on its soldiers who were much more interested in getting bacon and bread. So there was a, an anonymous senior supply officer in the 38th Welsh, Welsh Division who was very, very proud of his job and he's written a wonderful, or he wrote a wonderful little booklet. Um, it is a First World War booklet, it doesn't have a specific date on it, describing his job um, in the tiniest little detail and luckily for us he provides a, a very beautiful little map of how the food was transferred up to the trenches. So on the left hand side you see the base, that would be the base supply depots that were dotted along the French coast, places like Calais and, and Le Havre and Boulogne had these absolutely huge um, uh, uh, stores. I mean, the one at Le Havre was half a mile long, um, 600 foot wide, and held 80,000 tons of food. So these huge supply depots were built. Sometimes ships came straight from, um, you know, Argentina bearing the, the bully beef. Sometimes the food went to Britain first and was sorted out there. But they all ended up in these great sheds, warehouses um, in France. And every day, uh, a train, a puffer train, as opposed to a horse train, because the word's interchangeable, um, was sent up uh, to the front with huge, you know, supplies for all, all the men um, serving there. So it would leave the base, it would go by train to a regulating station because not every base carried every food stuff and the regulating station was a way of balancing the food stuffs across the different trains or going up to different um, divisions. So it then goes to the railhead, it then goes on motor transport, but as you can see, a lot of it is done by horse transport. So, you know, the dash lines are horses and mules that would carry the food um, up to near where the soldiers could then come back from the trenches um, and pick it up and carry it up themselves. Or some of it obviously would be served in um, reserve camps. Horses are absolute top priority for the army. The men are not top priority because it's felt that, you know, men aren't going to you know, if they go hungry for a few days, what does it matter? If you can't feed the horses and the mules, they can't pull the limbers. And if they can't pull the limbers, it's not so much that they won't transfer the food, it's that they won't transfer the arm, you know, the ammunition um, and the munitions to the front. So horses uh, and mules are absolutely army's top priority. Um, 380,000 of them apparently on the Western Front in late 1918. Uh, uh, five and a half million tons, Keegan reckons, of forage. Some of it was purchased locally, but it, a lot of it had to be shipped. Takes up a lot of um, space as well, you know, so that would have pushed men's food out. Um, and some very rather beautiful and very sentimental um, pictures of, of men and horses. Although, of course, if push came to shove, they were not adverse to eating horses. So uh, Ben Clouting, who was a cavalryman, um, you know, if a horse got hit by a shell, they would put it out of its misery. And if they had time, you know, they were not 
of you know unwilling uh, not not all men some men found that very distasteful because the british working class is unlike say the french or the um swiss didn't eat horse meat very often but um uh you know they were um used for for food as well occasionally and we can get a sense of the vast quantities of food from this uh, Imperial War Museum photograph. This is the Calais base, men loading onions into sacks. Um, there's a real lack of vegetables available. You know, they don't store well, do they? I mean, onions probably store better than most, but you know, trying to feed 1.8 million men fresh vegetables, it's tough, isn't it? Beyond onions and potatoes, it's, it's hard. So um, the army did actually have a series of uh, gardens, well, gardens, really, you know, huge vegetable producing areas in northern France um, and they liked the men to work on them when they were supposed to be in the rest camps but as you can imagine that didn't go down very well with soldiers whose idea of a rest was not toiling uh, on the British army allotment and also as, as a number of them pointed out in their memoirs you know, they're not very they're not very kind of team spirited in that they thought you know why should we spend all our hours planting seeds when we're probably not going to be here when some lucky whatever gets to harvest them so um not popular uh, this is the um army service corps helping load stuff onto uh, trains in Calais to go up to the front. The Army Service Corps gets, I have to be very careful because I've done talks in other places, I get Army Service Corps veterans or, or, or whatever, but they were not well liked by the regulars. They were called Anglais sans courage, English without courage by many of the other soldiers because they were reckoned to have something of a cushy life um, behind the lines, uh, you know, moving sacks and it's not, and that's not fair because some of them were very vulnerable, particularly when they were, you know, moving stuff around a bit closer to the front line. But it was thought that, you know, anything was better than being in a, in a front line trench. So the Army Service Corps were not popular generally. Now this is another um, army postcard, sketches of Tommy's life, and as you see from the kind of, you know, the, the joke here is, is that there's no fresh food at base, you know, what you need your bayonet for isn't going to be fighting the enemy so much as opening the many tins, um, pork and beans, you can see jam came in a tin, uh, 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 the biscuit came in a tin as well, hardtack biscuit, the bully beef, all that kind of thing, so a lot of reliance on tin food, and again, the British working class is not very familiar with tin food at this point, and it'd been a been there around a long time but it wasn't terribly well um, embedded in eating habits you know um, you might splash out and if you could afford it and have a tin of salmon um, on a you know a Sunday but you know tin food was not other than milk uh, was not something that the British working class has made much of um, at all uh, Another of my postcards, uh, and this there's nothing on the back of this one, sadly, but I, this is a lovely one of um, a ration distribution, isn't it? I, I assume. I don't know where it is. Don't know if it's in France. Don't know if it's some um, on you know an army camp here somewhere. But I would have thought the soldiers would be quite pleased with this because you know they've got fresh meat there, some carcasses hanging in the shed as well, aren't there? But also the bread on the right there um, would be um, uh, something you know they would be pleased to see because fresh bread uh, was often a problem too. One of the issues that the current British Army faces is what they call menu fatigue in that soldiers even when they you know they should be physiologically hungry because they've been doing all this exercise if they are presented with the same food day in day out they won't eat it or they won't eat enough of it because humans are very complex people uh, or, or, or animals rather that are kind of constantly torn between the need for familiarity in terms of eating but also the tendency to boredom so you know if you give people the same food every day it doesn't work well and the British Army and certainly the counts of British soldiers would suggest that you know this kind of relentless routine of, of bully beef and biscuit as it often was um, was uh, uh, you know very wearing to the soul now to avoid having to serve so much hardtack biscuit, knowing how unpopular it was, the army actually set up um, travelling bakeries, and here's one here, so it's like a wagon that would have been towed round to different places, and the bakers there uh, would be able to produce fresh bread um, at different locations um, uh, to try and, you know, kind of 
improve morale amongst hungry troops who were very fed up of hardtack biscuit, which is basically just salt and water, sometimes with a little fat in it, but it's not terribly, terribly appetizing. So this postcard is from the Luc Binet collection. He, Major Luc Binet, who's the French army. I met him at a visit to a French military museum by chance many, about 10 years ago, and it turns out his hobby is collecting postcards of um, bakeries. That's not some not the sort of person you meet every day, but it was terribly fortuitous for me. So he's got a marvellous collection of these um, uh, traveling bakeries. Now, this is absolutely despised. It was very, very difficult. Oops. I've got terrible interference. I don't know what that's about. I'm just going to switch my mic off for a moment. Oh, it stopped. Lovely. That's good. So we saw the problem with the teeth. You know, the British Army at the start of the war had no dentists. They'd had a few in the Boer War. They'd had a few in up between the Boer and the First World War, but it was very expensive. And anyway, the doctors said that they could perfectly well do it themselves. And as all they ever did was extractions, you know, that you can get an idea of what kind of dentistry was on offer. So there were no real dentists. Um, the British working classes, as I say, had no money for decent food, let alone dentistry on top of it. And I don't know if anyone's seen the Peter Jackson film, uh, They Shall Not Grow Old, this wonderful digital remastering, colouring of, of, of First World War soldier film. And one of the things that struck me was, you know, the teeth are dreadful. And we're not talking about uneven. We're talking about, you know, uh, m mouths with very few teeth in them and that is a very common view um, in that film so this kind of hard tack biscuit was just absolutely you know hugely problematic so men tended to do other things with it um, Sergeant Herring, as we'll see here from the Imperial War Museum ephemera collection, made a little picture frame and put his wife and twins into it. Um, people painted on it. It was used uh, to decorate the walls of dugouts by officers. Uh, tins of hardtack biscuit were used to floor um, as flooring in dugouts because, you know, it didn't get eaten. Um, and it was the butt of many, many jokes. Anyone who's interested in uh, Ben's father and old Bill, you know, this kind of Firewood and Graves mentions it, doesn't he, as kindling, I think, in goodbye to all that as well. If you had the time, you could grind it all up into a sort of porridge uh, and mix it, preferably with a tin of condensed milk and a tin of jam, and heat it up into a kind of sweet porridge that was very popular. There are also recipes, actually, for what they call chapatis. They're spelt very strangely, but obviously some regular um, soldiers who'd been in the, um, uh, you know, in India before the war um, had uh, uh, seen, you know, what could be done with, with flour and made into little pancakes and things. So, but, but of course, that requires you to be able to light a fire. Um, and that wasn't something that was, you know, terribly often available in the front front line um, 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 of the trenches because that would obviously attract uh, too much attention. Um, and, you know, it varies, of course, because if you're in some, somewhere like the Eep Salient, stuck up into um, uh, no man's land, you know, you're going to live on bully beef and, and tin biscuits for a week the whole time you're up there because it's very difficult to get hot food and supplies um, to that kind of very distant part. But in other parts of the line, you would be uh, hopeful of getting some hot food. And things like this, these temporary kitchens are set up. Um, to make sure that men got, you know, conscientious officers were aware that, you know, morale was you know, an army marches on its stomach, you know, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. They knew that hot food was very important. So if where, if where they could, they would do their best to set up kitchens to provide some kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, nutritious meal for the men. But of course, much depends, as Captain Basil Williamson said in his uh, account of the war, much depended on the skill and dedication of the cooks. And I quote, now, according to any of the memoirs, apart from the ones written by cooks, there were no skills and very little dedication. So, you know, the men are very rude about the cooks, partially, as I said before, because they saw them as being a cushy, you know, a cushy number. Um, but also, as not just in terms of safety, but it was a cushy number in that you were, you know, you had access to food stuff. Um, and there are, you know, people stole, pilfered um, and made profit. So, you know, this, the cooks were not 
the most popular uh, uh, amongst the regulars. And, but the army trained thousands and thousands of men in cookery schools um, across country. There was one in Colchester where I live at the barracks there. Um, but even if they were competent and even if they really tried very hard, they were only ever going to be as good as their ingredients. And sometimes, um, you know, the ingredients combined with the army recipes to make some very unappetizing uh, foodstuffs. Um, this is a recipe for fish cakes. See those herrings again, the Norwegian herrings that are still trying to get rid of, but also there are equal amounts of bully beef. So, you know, the army was kind of drowning in bully beef, really, for that and hardtack biscuit. And the breadcrumbs would have been made from hardtack rather than fresh bread. So, you know, this is a way of kind of serving up bully beef and biscuit in a slightly different form with a slightly fishy aroma to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's got, most of the army cooking in the field recipes feature uh, 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 bully beef in some form. All the different stews, you know, they sound quite interesting. Summer stew, bully beef. Winter stew, bully beef. Spring stew, you know, it's all the same kind of ingredients. Um, this is an image of uh, traveling uh, cookers. So apart from the ones we saw earlier where you could actually set up a little uh, permanent temporary slash if you see what I mean cooking station you could actually put vats of um, stew so you see the gaps there the, the holes on these wagons that went with the men when they were marching because a lot of the time men are moving around behind the western front there's a lot of activity of moving men from one place to another from one camp to another from one line to another so Developing these uh, uh, traveling kitchens meant that the food could march with them. They marched for 50 minutes in every hour, uh, and then they had a 10 minute break, and then they'd have a longer break when they ate. For the poor old cooks, they had to spend their 10 minutes stirring whatever was going on in the ovens. Um, and again, you know, this is it, hot food is important, but Sidney Rogerson in his wonderful, wonderful book, 12 Days on the Somme, and he's a very keen young officer, but when he writes about the stews, you think, really, really? He said, oh, you know, they put everything in it. It's marvellous. Herrings again, you know, bully beef, anything we can find goes in. The men love it. And I thought, well, I don't know if the men did love it, but uh, certainly the officers who generally ate differently and separately uh, felt that the men loved it, but um, that doesn't seem to be the experience of many of the men. If you're in the front line, as they say, if other front lines apart from the most um, exposed ones, they would try, the British Army, to carry hot food up to you at least once a day. When the war starts, men are doing that in Dixie. So they're carrying big cauldrons, one in each hand with a lid on, but they're having to negotiate, navigate very narrow trenches. So, you know, men were injured. Um, you know, and food was lost. So the British Army developed a pan pack, and you can see that on the back of the soldiers there. So it was a way of packing the Dixie into straw, so it kept the food hot, and most importantly, it kept the men, the carrying uh, men's hands free to allow them to, you know, steady themselves through what were often very, very dangerous. You know, when it was wet season, you know, one miss footing and you could go into six foot of water and mud so you know having your hands free was was important so those kinds of um, innovations such as they were were helpful and uh, although again you know soldiers I mean the British Army one of the things that British soldiers do is what they called growls. You had to, you know, grousing, grousing all day long is one of the army songs and grousing is complaining. So, you know, no soldier's going to say, oh, or few soldiers I would have thought would say it was marvellous. You know, they did a fantastic job. But there are, you know, complaints that even though the pan packs came up, it was spilt and it wasn't hot and so on and so forth. So it's hard to make men happy, especially men who think they might be having to go over the top of one of those trenches. And of course, the other thing was if they did get bacon if they were woken say at five o'clock on a fine morning um, with bacon coming up the line a feeling of dread would then ensue because you generally only got a really good breakfast before you went over the top so food is a very kind of tricky a very emotional subject you see men here eating hot food on the Somme in 1916 uh, from their mess tin sometimes they just heated the tin of meat up um, and ate straight from that but it wasn't just army food that was on offer there were other alternatives open to rank and file soldiers not just to the officers i mean one of the things that um 
you know, I use this one on the cover of the book, but uh, John Singer Sargent, you know, ironically called it Thou Shalt Not Steal. And one of the soldiers on the one on the left is looking slightly furtive, but I don't know why, because it was very common practice uh, to steal from the orchards, the farms, the abandoned houses, you know, uh, dynamite streams for fish, shoot game in woods. Um, a good scrounger was much admired, you know, he was called an organiser by his fellow soldiers, and they were valuable skills in cold and hungry locations. Um, when uh, complaints were made to the officers, as they often were, uh, officers generally, you know, took the side of the men. And Captain Dunn in, um, recalls in his diary that he, he sort of listens to the French farmer and apologises and nods. And when he talks to the men separately afterwards, he says, can you not do it after dark? You know, because it's an accepted you know, they're not going to be able to stop soldiers doing this, but perhaps if they could get caught a little less often, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, sometimes soldiers saw opportunities uh, to get extra food and, of course, other opportunities too. This is a, another uh, World War One postcard because all the French uh, farm male farm workers were off, or most of them, serving in their armies elsewhere. So when the harvest had to be got in, British and Canadian soldiers, this is a Canadian soldier, I think, could be deployed to help the French um, women folk and old men get the harvest in. They didn't take kindly to that because... You know, that was another thing for them to complain about. They hadn't joined up the army to serve, you know, king and country to end up digging potatoes in some godforsaken field in France. But there was always the opportunity of some um, uh, fraternisation. Um, although called broth brothels were legal um, uh, and open on the Western Front till the British Army got a bit fed up with them in 1917. Uh, and venereal disease, of course, was a huge problem for the British Army. But I digress. We're talking about food, uh, not sex. The two are not unassociated, but so uh, we'll stick to food for the moment. Um, it's not all farming and stealing. There were lots of canteens. This is a a wonderfully stocked canteen. I was deeply impressed by this, but uh, it was a posed shot apparently. So the Imperial War Museum catalogue says uh, for a photographer who'd come over to see what was going on in the canteens in France. Again, many accounts of them suggest that when they did get, after queuing and queuing, when they did get to the front of the queue, soldiers complained that all that was left was boot polish and matches uh, and food was often very much not not in evidence. Now officers have more money, they also have access to transport so there are lots of accounts of officers travelling to local towns, uh, Amiens was a centre of um, you know great sociability and eating in rather nice restaurants and cafes there. That transport uh, and money not available to most rankers so French farmers and uh, you know their womenfolk are very quick to set up what they called estaminet so you know anyone would open up their front room or indeed the table outside their house uh, and serve food to local soldiers so I'd like to say that it was a kind of venture of French cuisine and excitement but mainly all the British wanted to eat was egg and chips and my favourite account is W.J. Bunbury, who managed to eat nine eggs over a consecutive supper and breakfast that he records proudly in his diary. So, uh, you know, very even when opportunities were there um, to try perhaps, you know, although food is in relatively short supply in France as well, uh, the, the British soldiers prefer to stick with what they knew. And I suppose being served food in a home environment by elderly women, or if you're really lucky, young women too, you know, was a reminder of um, happier meals um, at home. And thinking of home, one of the things that really sustains soldiers, of course, is parcels. Um, and advertising campaigns are like this. The OXO advertising campaign was based on the kind of parcels to be sent to soldiers. Um, yeah, well, you do. And of course, if a soldier reported sick, um, a frontline soldier, he was sent to the medic and generally this, the line was that all you got given was a number nine pill which was a laxative and sent away again. So, um, you know, it's a kind of big joke, constipation um, and diarrhoea in the army but I think really it's it's also very problematic because to suffer with digestive disturbances in the frontline trench, you know, where the facilities are, well, a biscuit tin or an entrenching tool or something like that, and you're surrounded by other men, you know, it's not pleasant. So, in fact, constipation would probably be preferable. Anyway, so parcels are very important. 
um, places like Harrods cash in on this very quickly. Uh, they set up a war comforts department where they can get everything you'd want to put in a parcel from food to medicine to socks in one department, one floor. Um, but even, you know, lower down the scale from Harrods and Fortnum's, uh, grocers like Lipton's um, uh, uh, introduced parcels uh, packaged up parcels ready for the front. Uh, comforts funds were set up to send out food. These were set up at home by the generally the wife of a very senior officer uh, and <clears throat> they could actually provide quite significant quantities of food, not just chocolate and cigarettes, you know, at Christmas and what have you. Um, the second Rifle Brigade's funds records are held at the National Army Museum and in November 1915 they state that in the previous four months they'd sent over 1,000 tins of milk, 32 pounds of curry powder and 72 large tins of bloater paste um, out to the Rifle Brigade. So these are quite significant amounts of food and milk is hardly a luxury item is it? Uh, curry powder is very popular, I suppose because of the regular British Army soldiers who liked it. And interestingly enough, a lot of the um, MREs, um, meals ready for eating, that uh, the British Army uses have a little mini, uh, in the modern day British Army, have a little mini um, bottle of Tabasco in it. Because, you know, rubbish food probably goes down a bit easier for a lot of people if it's got some very hot sauce on it. Um, gifts were sent out, not just from personal, you know, contacts and family, but also from organisations. And we have the, sort of, um, you know, Queen Alexandra Fund, the Princess Mary uh, boxes at Christmas. Um, the one on the right always makes me laugh. To our fighting heroes with best wishes from the British Grocers Federation. I'm sure that a soldier standing in six inches of mud being shelled would have been delighted that the grocers at home were thinking of him um, at Christmas 1914. So that probably would have elicited a, a, a string of expletives. But the most important alternative food source really, both in terms of kind of physiological um, uh, provision, but also in sustaining kind of emotional relationships and connections with home, were those parcels from home. Um, and this is uh, um, from the sphere. I think it's 1916 actually, when four and a half million parcels were sent through the British Expeditionary Fund. So, you know, just huge and, and all sorts of food was sent. I mean, you know, people sent things like whole roast chicken, you know, brawn, which in the summer, you know, the Postal Service was brilliant. The whole of Regent's Park, but, well, not the whole of it, but huge part of Regent's Park was turned into a sorting office. Um, you know, you could post a letter here and it could be delivered, um, you know, certainly to the kind of um, Calais the next day. It might take a lot longer to get up to the line, but, you know, Postal Service was very good. So food was sent um, with gay abandon. It was also sent home as well. Uh, the British Army had to forbid it, I think, in 1916, because um, people were sending butter home from France. Uh, soldiers were sending butter home and it was melting and causing a lot of trouble. They were also sending shrapnel and other sort of bits and bobs that they found. So the army had to crack down on that kind of thing. But it is these parcels from home that are, are, are so important to the soldiers. I mean, it's not great quality. Um, there's a typo as well in it. See what pleasure we take in tasting all the good things you send us. This was produced in France, this postcard. But the parcels weren't just food. You know, men were sent socks, men were sent pencils and writing paper and all sorts of bits and bobs. But it is the food, and in particular the home cooked food, um, that uh, you know was 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 what really uh, was really important to them. And there is something about home cooked food. There's a wonderful story in um, All Quiet on the Western Front when I can't remember if it's Paul comes back from. Uh, a visit home and he has unpacked he brings with him some potato cakes that he unpacks and he shares with his friends and one of them bites into it and turns to him and says did your mother make these and and Paul says yes she did and the man says yeah I can tell so this kind of idea that you know mothers love because the demography of the British Army it was that most of the men were young and of course there's lots of married men but it's mainly you know there's a high proportion of unmarried men so it's mothers sending food and that kind of home cooked food you see it a lot in letters home um, and this kind of demand for parcels and this is hard for relatively poor families you know to sustain especially if they've got two sons or three sons fighting um, and there's a, a very sad collection um, in the Imperial War Museum from a, a 
private C.R. Jones, who writes home very wistfully, I am rather in the cold because fellows are continually getting parcels and then wondering why he wasn't. And very touching that after his death on the Somme um, in September 1916 and before his family gave his papers to the museum, they annotated them to explain that they had checked and they had sent out four to six parcels a month lest anyone else coming along later and reading should have any doubt about their love and concern for him. And another Private Jones, P.H. Jones this time, uh, says, uh, and I quote, I think my idea of hell would be the front without parcels. And this kind of home-cooked aspect in my last slide here, um, this is from the War Illustrated, Christmas 1916, and the man holding up the pudding there, um, and the lovely sort of home-stirred and stirring thoughts of home. So food is this medium through which love of all sorts, uh, you know, mother's love, wife's love, you know, any kind of love really can be transmitted across the channel from um, home to battlefront um, to soldiers who you know, need to be reminded of, of what it is they're fighting for um, and, and to be assured that the family that they're doing it for are thinking of them and holding them um, in their hearts. And the other thing as well about this image is that, you know, see the small group of men, that one of the things that comes through very much in the memoirs of soldiers is the sense of fairness that they felt that they um, uh, uh, demonstrated when it came to sharing food. So parcels were generally shared. Uh, if food was often delivered in a big lump, a loaf of bread that then had to be divided between men themselves. So the British soldier is very good at sharing and for them that kind of equity is something that they then kind of use as a metaphor for the greater inequities um, and injustices um, of the army. So for soldiers food is a site of, uh, of home and of memory um, and in the trenches and in the army it's um, also a site of sharing and uh, camaraderie and sometimes you know it can be a reminder that uh, you know the, the thing that they had signed up for and the organization with which they had signed up the the British army wasn't always looking after them quite as well as they thought it might right Half past seven. That was absolutely Bang fantastic on. I think normally so any questions the first world war in particular with men going over the switch your mic on or chip the, in um logistics that uh, were obviously required to get food to them. Um, we, we appreciate that it didn't always work, but ju just mm. thinking about it, I mean, when you talked about uh, cookery schools, um, I would never have thought of that. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about the thousands and thousands of men and the thousands and thousands of horses, I mean, it's quite amazing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was just, I mean, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Um, you know, that it's very easy to be critical, isn't it? But, uh, you know, the British Army, the logistics of it were just huge. Um, and I think the, the issue perhaps for historians is, thinking of it as a historical research problem, is that we know how much food, you know, the British Army bought overall and how much it spent overall. And we have the men's comments about, well, we didn't get enough of this. But it's very hard to know what happened in between. You know, it would be lovely to have records of how much food was received, you know, or, or in a, a, a frontline situation on a given day. And we can get some of that from kind of well, some yeah, medical well, officer's well, diaries like Captain Dunn's. Mm -hmm. But it, it's yeah. very difficult uh, to know the truth of it. And I suppose in a way, a um, whether, uh, it doesn't doesn't matter, does it? Because food is an emotional thing, you know. So even if they had been fed, yeah, I think it might not have made them happy. <laughs> what for food? <laughs> I think they like the wine better. <laughs> um, I think the I think the officer class did Denise, and and they were kind of very keen on um, uh, the restaurants in Amiens in particular, and write about the food that they had there. But for the British ranker, you know, it, it was. Uh, you know, it, it, the cheese smelled odd. You know, they they would eat the bread, but mainly, you know, everything else they were a bit was a bit suspect to them. So, no, I think it's the short answer to that. That and also, 
compared to the amount of army food they consumed, it was probably relatively small amounts, so they didn't get a chance to um, uh, 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 try too much mm -hmm. f good French cuisine, probably. And of course, the, the, the people running the estaminet were just keen to make money, so they would, you know, cook what they could and what the soldiers wanted, which was just egg and chips, really. Often they cook sold food for soldiers. You know, people might be sent food in a parcel, and, and a French woman would cook it for them. It's interesting what um, uh, Lucy says about wine. Um, it, it, absolutely, no one in the British working classes, I wouldn't have thought, other than perhaps my aunt, great aunt Wynne used to drink Wynne Carnis tonic wine. I don't know what that was, but, uh, you know, wine was not something that the British working classes drank a lot of, if at all. Um, they weren't allowed, the British Army said that rank and file soldiers should not have spirits. And there's actually a story um, in Frederick Manning's, Manning's book um, uh, about a, a bottle of whiskey being smuggled out um, in a loaf of bread in a parcel. But they liked wine. Um, Oliver Coleman in a diary in Ipswich said, had my first taste of wine today in his diary said, oh, hot, he says exclamation mark. So, you know, coarse red wine, I suppose it's more alcoholic than beer, wasn't it? So that was quite popular when they could get hold of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it wasn't not something that, again that they take back home. Yes, rum. Well, rum was. I'm just going to say that Alan mentions Alan mentions rum here. Well, rum was on army issue, um, but as the as the songs say, the sol the sergeants get all the rum, don't they? Along with the you know the strawberry jam, and the soldiers get plum and apple and no rum. So there were kind of um, a bigger earthenwares of of rum um, that were supposed to be delivered to the front line. The official, I can't remember if it's half a gill or something, it's some kind of old imperial measure, but it's basically like an egg cup full of rum. But one of the issues with that was when it did turn up, it generally meant that an attack was imminent because more often than not, it didn't. So rum was available, but often on mornings of attack. Oh, that's a good question from Sue about fresh water. Think how heavy water is. You know, it weighs so much. So transporting water to the front was a real issue. They often used old petrol cans, which um, the soldiers swore that no one had ever washed out. So the kind of water tasted very petrolly. But it is, it is a logistical nightmare. And they had big bowsers, I suppose you call them, you know, tanks of water. They'd get as close as they could. But what happened, Sue, was, was when water in the summer, when it was hot um, and people were desperate, they would use water from puddles. And of course, they're fighting in land that has been fought on for three or four years certainly by the, towards the end of the war. And so that meant that, you know, it was, and it was farmland before that. So it was polluted water and they drink out of a crater and then discover, you know, when it, the water level went down a bit that, um, you know, there was a body or something in the bottom of it. But fresh water, I and mean, there there are um, accounts of soldiers drinking I've their own urine in, in the Wimby. summer, I have I've read. I don't know um, how true that is, night. but, uh, uh, you know, the water was a... Was a <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. Very oh, grateful thank you. to you. Okay.